working. Yeah. So uh, thanks to Brian for that kind introduction. Uh, you know, at the University of Buffalo in 1991, that was my, uh, my first full-time coaching job. And uh, Brian at the time was the offensive coordinator. So uh, he had his first kid, Ryan, who's now on the staff at, at, at Utica College. And uh, so Brian would go home after practice. So I'd get up at 5 in the morning, pick him up, we get donuts and coffee. That's when I had to start learning how to drink coffee. And uh, we would start our meetings at 6 in the morning to knock out the film. And Brian needed to ride home. And his wife Linda would pick dinner for me two times a week. So uh, this is uh, it's really an honor to come back here and speak to this group. Um, as, as Brian mentioned, I, I'm a New York State guy. I was born and raised in New York. I'm a Section 6 guy. Um, I spent 26 of my first 36 years of life living in New York State. My coaching career, the first 15 years of my career in New York State was my primary uh, recruiting area. And, uh, you know, honestly, at the end of recruiting, you know, these clinics and, and traveling, but I wouldn't say no to this one. Um, you know, this is my home. So just a little bit of my background. I am a product of, of New York State coaching. Um, Just first a little bit where I'm at now. Um, I'm at Wake Forest University, and we are, uh, we are the smallest school in the Power Five conferences. We have an enrollment of about 4,800 students. We're a top 25, top 30 national university. It's absolutely beautiful. Um, very similar to New York in terms of the beauty, except much warmer weather. Uh, so I, I got on a plane, it was 57. When I landed, it was 17. And uh, if any of you ever want to come down, you're more than welcome. We start spring football uh, mid-March, and it goes to April. Just my background, um, I came from Section 6 in, uh, in New York. Uh, I'm a Lukeport Lancer. I played for Harry Lawler, who was a graduate of Ithaca College. And, uh, and so that, that was where I grew up and where I went to high school and where I was raised. And was very well coached there. So again, I'm a Section 6 guy. Um, as a coach, my first coaching job uh, as a GA was in New York. Uh, I'm very proud to say that I was mentored by Bob Ford, who I think is one of the best college coaches in the history. He put out more coaches and taught us ethically how to do things. And uh, when I was at Albany, it's the first time I recruited, and I had New York State then. The first full-time coaching job I ever got was at the University of Buffalo, where I met Brian. Um, and we were there two years when the program elevated from Division Three to One AA, and I got to recruit with scholarships for the first time. And then my first head coach in the guy uh, was in New York City at Fordham. So almost everything uh, in my coaching career came from New York State and this group of coaches. So as a high school player, GA, full-time coach, head coach, uh, it all was in New York. And, um, I'll just say this, that I owe a debt to so many people in this room and the people before that. Um, you know, have them work the state. Um, you know, and this goes back to years, but when you first start coaching, when you're 21, 22, 23 years old, and you're going into high schools for the first time, I mean, there were some intimidating coaches in New York. I knew right away I was at a disadvantage because my name didn't end in a vowel. Uh, <laughs> It really, especially here in New York City and Westchester, and, and I can go through every section here. I mean, Dick, Dick Domenico at Albion High School. You know, if you guys know Dick, um, there's really two people in my life I have a hard time saying no to. One is my wife, and the other is Dick. Not necessarily in that order. <laughs> so when Dick asks me to speak, you know, he gives you the cuz, bro. We need you. Um, so that I committed that, but when I started recruiting Section 6, Dick said, these are the guys you need to know. And he sent me to Don Santini. And all those guys tell me, these are the good programs, these are the players. And they spent hours with me explaining the landscape. And then, uh, you know, down in New York City, and I know these guys aren't here, but the DiMatteo brothers. You know, certainly at Roosevelt, uh, Dom and Tony, what those guys did. And the first scholarship player I ever recruited as a coach was a player out of North Rockland with Joe Passarella. And, and Joe was phenomenal. And then you go down to, to Staten Island and, and you know Coach Paterzo down there. And again, he gave me a few tongue lashings of who I need to take. And those of you who know Al, but he cared deeply about his kids. And then 
and Long Island. You go down there and Joe Vito from Roosevelt and those guys. So I had every section of the state at some point. And I'll just say this, going back 30 years ago as a player in New York State to where New York State football is now, for the younger coaches, you have no idea how far New York State football has advanced. I mean, we really, and I say we because I'm a New York State guy, have progressed so much. We did not have a great reputation. New York State was a state that football was not considered important. You played eight games, there was no state championship, uh, there were no all-star games, and now 30 years later, we have state championships. We're playing more than eight games, most of you. Um, I remember when the Governor's Bowl got started, and I couldn't wait to help get involved in that game. And the first time the Governor's Bowl was played, we, uh, they practiced at Fordham when I was the head coach. And to be able to start that, and uh, again, it's uh, an honor, and I'm indebted to be here. And what I'm going to do is, I think this is the fifth or sixth time I've spoken at this clinic. I spoke when I was at uh, Fordham, Bowling Green, Richmond, um, and even as an assistant. So, you know, when you're a position coach, you talk about techniques, and when you're a coordinator, you talk about plays. And, and what I want to talk about now is as a head coach, you, you really got to look at a program broad stroke. And these are some things that I've even learned in the last five years that I can't believe I didn't figure out earlier. And that's the beauty of, of coaching, is that if you do it right, you're continually learning, you're continually growing. And uh, I'm gonna share with you, uh, Wake Forest is my fourth head job. Uh, at the other three programs, we were fortunate enough to recruit great kids, we had great assistant coaches, and we built championship programs at Fort Hill, Richmond, and Bowling Green. And certainly we're gonna try to do the same at Wake Forest. We've run different defenses. I've been a 4-3, I've been a 4-4, I've been a 4-2-5. We've been odd front. And we've won championships doing all those things. We have offenses that run the ball, throw the ball, we've run option, we've been an empty. All those different things can work and you can be effective and win games. And it kind of boils down to our, what are some of the core values? And this is more football. I'm not gonna give the whole philosophy of faith and family and academics, and those are all things that we certainly subscribe to and we think are important. But what are some things football-wise that we try to get done that I think would be applicable to any program, any level of football, that we constantly try to do at Wake Forest and the ACC, okay? And the one thing right now, and this is gonna seem very simple, but in a day and age that kids play video games more than they play, Sandlot baseball and football, and they're not allowed to tackle each other. Uh, I'm amazed at how little our players actually know about the game of football. And, and I picked this up, uh, you know, from Greg Schiano. Uh, Greg, when he was at Rutgers, became a friend of mine. I used to go visit him at Tampa Bay. And even in the NFL, you know, these are things he does. So what we do every preseason camp, and I do it every spring, and this is great as the head coach, because as a head coach now, I don't call plays, I don't coach a position, and I love coaching. This is my way of getting in front of the football team. I have a 21-point lesson plan that I call Football 101. That in preseason camp, I'll get in front of our team, and I will teach our guys football, situational football. And we break it down three different ways. Okay, the first thing we break down to our offense and our defense is down and distance situations. And I'll go through every down and distance we cover. Okay, the next thing that we cover is field position situations. Okay, and the third thing we cover are clock situations. So uh, the whole kind of thing with our football team, and sometimes as freshmen it goes over their head, as sophomores they maybe get a third to half of it, but by juniors and seniors, I can get these kids in front of the team and they can teach the rest of the team football. Is our, our whole point with this is you're never just playing football. Every single snap in a football game is a situation. And the team that wins the most of those situations ends up winning the game. So you're never not just playing. You always have to aware, have an awareness of down and distance. Where are you on the field? What is the clock situation? You know, first and 10 on the 20 for the opening drive is much, much different than first and 10 on the 15 going into the red zone. Or much different than first and 10 down six with 58 seconds left to go in the game. 
and we try to get our kids to realize the situation in the game. And the way we break it down, and I will get in front of the team, and I will take one of these things every day. So we start uh, with down and distance. Okay, the first down that we teach is first and ten. You know, what is first and ten? Well, first and ten is a huge momentum down. Because in every situation except one, the offense has captured momentum. They've either made a first down, they've, tur they've got the ball in a turnover, they got a penalty, they got a first down. The only situation at first and 10 is a defensive advantage is if they just score and they kick off to you. So it is a huge momentum down in football. And it's a situation, so what we do is what is the situation what is the goal and what is going to be our plan for this down and distance throughout the course of the season? So there's a magic number. With first and ten, we say it's four. The offense gets four or more yards, they have won the down. If the defense holds them to three or less, they have won the down. And so every day in practice, you will never ever see us take a snap of practice that we don't have a down and distance and I make the kids be aware of it. And you'll hear our kids first and ten. Hey, four, 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 four. They know to win that down, they've got to get four yards or prevent four yards. And this will be a ten-minute lesson the first day of the game. And then we break down second downs. You know, second and schedule. You know, second and three to seven. You know, three to six. The offense has kept momentum. They are on schedule. Second and off schedule. You know, two to eight, nine, ten plus. The defense has won the first down. They have momentum. Or second and short. We make our kids very aware of second and first, uh, you know, one and two. And we define the situation. So off schedule, the goal is, and, and this leads into third down, if you look at third down conversion percentage, <coughs> The best teams in the NFL and in college, if it's third and eight plus, are only converting 20% of those downs. The best teams in football on third downs convert 45, 50%. So our whole thing as an offense and as a defense is on offense, we never want to be third and seven plus because we know the odds of converting that third down are real, real low. On a defense, if we can ever get teams at that down and distance, the odds are 80% in our favor, we're gonna capture the momentum of the football game. And we, we show them all those percentages and all those breakdowns, and then we just go out one day and all we do is practice second down. <laughs> that we'll have a second down period and it'll be 15 snaps, and the first offense will get six snaps, and two of it will be off schedule, two of it will be schedule, and two of it will be short. And if it's second and one to two, we, it's a waste down for the defense. They know that they, if there's a good offense they're playing, there's a great chance they're getting a shot play. And our offense knows, hey, don't be surprised if we don't call that double move or that play action post on second down. We're going for the jugular. We've got momentum. We trust you guys on third and one. You're going to get the first down. We're going for the throw. We're going to put that thing and get six points on the board. And that way our players now, in scrimmages, in games, anticipate those calls. Quarterback gives a nod, hey, I've got it. Hey, this is coming, guys, here we go. Okay, the last thing we hit is third downs, and we break third downs into five different categories. Third and one, which we define as short yardage. Third and two to three, which can be a very, very balanced down, maybe 50% run, 50% pass, or a down that the offense and the defense will play their personality. For a running team, it's a run down, throwing team is a throw down. Four to six, which is probably a heavier throw down, but now all the hots and the three-step game and the screen game and maybe the draw game come into play. Uh, third seven plus, okay, which is a primarily a pass down, but it's a protection down that you're not going to be able to throw hots and get first downs. The three-step is eliminated. And then third and 11 plus, which we define as double steps. I mean, I've had kids on third and 15 think it's third and five and jump around and give up a touchdown. And every one of these meetings is a night meeting. So right there, six, those are the first 10 days of camp. All we do is talk down in distances. 
And we go out that day and practice that down in distance. And uh, it is amazing in games, the recall. I mean, I love it when our defense is out there third and 12 and the whole defense is shouting, double stick, double stick, double stick. They're all aware where the sticks are. Okay, but we define every one of those uh, down in distances, the situation, what is the goal, what is our plan. And we do it in preseason camp, and we try to carry that stuff through through the entire season. So we're not adding a bunch of new stuff. Okay, and this has really, really been good stuff. And you know, the amount of times on a third and six that our receiver runs a five-yard route and we punt the ball on fourth and one has gone way down since we've started doing this. Are we perfect at it? Of course not. But I think our players are so more educated on what we're trying to accomplish here. Okay, the next thing that we get is what we call field position situations. Okay, that we teach our kids where they are on the field can have power over the down and distance. So again, first and 10 is first and 10, but first and 10 on your own one yard line or first and 10 on the 15 going in is a lot different than first and 10 on the 35 or 36 yard line after a punt. So this is the next plan. We hit the down and distances, we hit the field position. Okay, and then the first concept we introduce is uh, red zone. You know that we really feel the three most important uh, statistics in football to win football games is turnover margin, red zone offense, third down defense. Those are the three things that we feel dictate wins and losses more than anything else. So we talk extensively about the red zone. We talk about the extended red zone between the 25 and the 15 that you know, the, the, the vertical stretch passing game can still be executed. You can still throw a post route on the 22 yard line and you can still run high low pass concepts. Okay, we talk about how personalities of offenses will change. On the 35 yard line with a bad kicker, it's a four down situation. So now second and 10 is really first and 10. And you're gonna get first and 10 plays and we're gonna call first and 10 plays. Uh, then we talk about tight red zone, how the field shrinks, the personality of the defense can change, how the offense may run more wildcat to block the extra hat because the safety's in the box. And we give our offense and defensive philosophy for those things that, again, we hope carry through the year. Okay, the last thing we talk about is the must score zone. What happens when the ball crosses the five yard line? Okay, and we define it two different ways. It's must score if it's more than one yard per play. So, you know, fourth and goal on the two, third and goal on the three, second and goal on the four is must score. If it's one yard per play, we define it as goal line. That now heavier sets, sub defenses, um, so again, fourth and goal on the one or third and goal on the one if you're down by two, are up by two, we define those different situations for our team, okay? And then finally, coming out. The offense has the ball inside their five yard line, okay, and the goal is we must make two first downs, we can never turn the football over, and we never ever wanna to have to punt the ball with our punter's feet in the end zone. We don't, want to, we don't have to score. If we can make two first downs, avoid tight punt, and play the field position game, that is a win in coming out. Okay, so there, one, two, three, four, five. That takes us 15 days into camp. And then the last thing we hit are what we call clock situations. Okay, two minute is a lot of different situations. Okay, number one is end of the half. Two minute end of the half, what's the goal? Two minute end of the half, the score is irrelevant. No matter what the score is, you're head behind, you're trying to get points, you're trying to capture momentum, you're always playing to try to get a field goal, hoping for a touchdown. You can never ever turn the football over, never give the other team momentum going in. Okay, then we talk about end of game situations. Okay, limited clock. And we will do all these situations. We will say it's end of the game and we're tied. Okay, what is, the, what is the situation, what is the goal, what is the plan? 
So with a minute 58 left in the game with one timeout and you're on the 25 yard line, what you're gonna do is a lot different with a tie score than if you're down one or two. If you're down one or two, it's four down territory, you gotta get to a point on the field to kick a field goal and win the football game. Okay, if it's tied, you might be a little bit more conservative. We may run the ball, try to get a first down, go to our attack to offense after a made first down. Okay, we then talk about what we're gonna do if we're down three, which is different than if you're tied or down one or two. How are you gonna manage the game if you're down four to six, when well, now you need to score a touchdown? How about if you're down seven? Are you gonna play for the tie and go to overtime, or are you on a road against a team that's better than you? You gotta tell those kids right away, guys, we're going for two, okay? What if you're down eight? You gotta have that two-point play ready to go. What if you're down eight to 11? First possession, you may kick the field goal, you keep hope alive, try to get a touchdown late. What if you're down 12 plus? Now you have to score two touchdowns. So when we introduce two minute, I have a checklist of all these situations. And we make sure we hit every single one of them at least two times before we start our first game. So we're gonna have at least two two minute drills at the end of the half, end of the game tied, all those situations. And before the drill starts, I will go to our offense, okay, what is the goal? What are you trying to accomplish here? Okay, and, and just those things, I think, help them understand the play call. And the other thing that really helps us on defense is we define all two-minute situations as chunk or challenge. Okay, what is chunk, what is challenge? If there are more seconds than yards that the offense has in a two-minute drill, it's challenge. We cannot concede throws. We can't concede eight-yard hitches, okay? If there is more yards than seconds, so for instance, we have a lead. The other team has the ball in the 20-yard line. We are up by six, and there is 51 seconds left in the game. What is it? Is it chunk or challenge? It's chunk, because if they don't make big plays, they're not gonna win the game. So we teach our corners, don't jump hitches, don't jump shallow crosses and give up the dig route. Keep the ball in front of you, keep it in play, make them execute plays. And then you gotta teach your players to midstream adjust, which is really hard, but intelligent veteran players can do it. So a situation can start out chunk, and if they hit a 30 yard play, it right away goes to challenge. So our corners now have to know, hey, we're playing whatever, cover four, but instead of cover four challenge, it's cover or chunk, it's now challenge. We're now jumping routes, we're now playing aggressively, we're not conceding throws. And uh, again, this has been, I think, really, really good stuff for us. Anytime it's two scores, it's automatic chunk. We're not gonna give up cheap ones and free ones. We'll take a chance and we'll get the onside kick. Okay, and finally, we talk about four minute situations, which we define as the offense has the ball and a lead late in the game. Okay, this is what we're gonna do on offense, this is what we're gonna do on defense. And we'll practice four minute at least three times before the game. So again, the, the whole thought is, we are teaching our players the game of football. Not necessarily, you know, what the down block or how we're running the power, but situational football. And, and hopefully we get it, it still amazes me watching NFL games, how often a middle linebacker on a third and five, or a third and whatever, 12, will jump a shallow cross and they give up a dig route. We, we always talk about those things with our kids. And we, after, what I do in, in practice all the time is after a play's over, I'll go to the player and I say, what was the down and distance? And they need to know. Okay, and again, it's, they pick more and more of it up, and by the time you have a veteran football team, I believe these things can really help win you games. And, and for me, it's fun as the head coach, this is the way that I get to, to still coach football, because the assistants and the coordinators hate it when I walk in their meetings. <laughs> okay, and then we also talk about taking safety situations. When are situations in games that we will take a safety? You know, uh, 30 seconds left, uh, we're up 11, um, and the ball's inside our five-yard line. 
that we're going to try to run plays that bleed the clock, and we'll take a safety and be up nine and, and kick the ball from the 20. And, and we teach our kids, the quarterbacks and the punters, how to take safeties. And I mean, these things have won us some football games. You know, uh, where's Kevin Vanderzee? I mean, Rich, uh, you know, Richmond JMU, uh, 2007. This stuff won us a game, our four minute. Because our quarterback knew that if he could get three more seconds per play, we weren't going to have to punt the football. And that clock went out with one on the 30 second. You know, it was, it was neat. It was neat to see all this stuff get applied and actually win a game. Okay, and then we also talk about the last play of the game. We will run uh, at the end of camp, say it's the last play of the game, and we'll put the ball inside the 10, inside the 20, inside the 40, and pass midfield. These are the plays we're going to run. These are the plays you're going to get. And then we will rehearse those plays every Thursday at our walkthrough. So if the game is on the line with five seconds left, our offensive kids already know what play we're going to call. And the defense knows what defense we're going to call. OK, um, the, the next thing I'm going to talk about, and uh, this is going to seem really, really obvious. I did not figure this out until 2012. So this, this next year will be my 27th year as a college football coach. I didn't figure this out until 24 years. And it seems so obvious, um, but this had, I think, so much to do with why we started winning at Bowling Green. You know, we had a good year there, then two bad years, and then our kids got older and learned football more. <coughs> what I call player participation and involvement. And you probably already know this, but I didn't figure this out for 24 years. And so if it helps you, great. You know, if you think it, I'm an idiot for taking 24 years for me to figure this out, you're very accurate. Um, okay, the more players on your football team who play, the better your team is, the better your locker room is, the better your team morale will be, the better your staff will be, because they've got more happy kids in their meeting room, and the better the future of your program will be. I, I never ever figured this out as an assistant coach, that I was so driven that I wanted the best 11 plays on the field at all times. I never wanted to take a play that my best receiver wasn't there to put my third best kid. And then what happens over the course of time is all that enthusiasm your players have in preseason camp <coughs> When you go one game, two games, three games, and you're only playing 11 or 12 kids, what you've done is you beat the hope out of every other kid on your team. Um, and again, I, I, at the end of the year, I sit down with every player in our program and go over their goals and, you know, are you happy in the program? Are you enjoying yourself? What do you like about it? And shocker, the kids that play like it, the kids that don't play aren't happy. But if you're only playing 11 or 12 kids on offense and 11 and 12 kids on defense, two-thirds of your locker room isn't happy. And so when practice is over and they go in that locker room and they've got no hope to play Friday night or Saturday afternoon, do you think they're promoting you and your program? And so it, it, um, it, it really, I was doing all these surveys and you know, to engage our younger players, and we did this, and we started doing this in 2011, 2012. But I, I told our defensive coordinator, the first four games of the year are non-conference schedule. I didn't care. I wanted at least 19 kids in our defensive football team to play at least 10 snaps a game. What? I said, I, I, if we lose a game because the third or fourth corner gives up a play, that is on me. But for the non-conference part of the, the game, I don't ever want to come in Sunday that we don't have at least 19 kids on defense that played at least 10 snaps. So what you're really talking about is at every position, I use the term a pair and a spare. So a defensive tackle, we were going to play two and have a spare. Defensive end, two and have a spare. Inside linebacker, two and have a spare. Safety, corner. That gets you up to 17, 18, 19 players. And we were going to play them no matter what. If the number two kid was here and the three kid was here, it's easy. If the two guys here and the three guys here, that's hard. 
And maybe you got to call different defenses or do things to protect them. But we're going to play 19 kids. Now, after four games, if they're not improving, if they're not getting better, then we get into the conference schedule and, and then we'll adjust. Okay, so we go into this that our goal on defense is that we were going to play a minimum of 19 players, 10 plus snaps a game. Um, and at times it hurt us. We maybe gave up a third down we shouldn't give up. Uh, I don't know if it ever cost us a game. Um, but it was amazing. We started doing this and our, our practice tempo got better. Our locker room was happier. The meeting rooms, more players were engaged. As the head coach, when I got up and gave the game plan, I had more eyes looking at me than doing like this. And what this did for the morale of our football team was incredible. And the other thing it did is in week seven, when our starting corner got hurt in a conference game, the guy you're putting in has now played football. And, and this, I didn't count special teams reps. They had to play 10 plus snaps of defense. Okay, and then what happened to do this, to get more players involved, is our defensive coordinator, Mike Elko, who, who does a great job for us, um, he started coming up with, he took it a, a step further. He came up with all these packages. I mean, if there's a, uh, a money denomination somewhere in the world, we came up with it. So we had nickel, dime, quarter, dollar, penny, heavy, jumbo. When we do our defensive game plan, we had eight to 10 personnel groups. In some of these groups, we had all the same exact calls. But maybe the rover's different. Maybe the buck is different. And so we had kids in our team that took pride. Hey, I'm a starter on dime. I'm a starter on nickel. I'm a starter in the quarter package. Hey, the game's on the line. We're in quarter. You're a starter. This game may come down to you. And all these kids now feel like they're starters. Um, it was unbelievable. And again, it, it took me 24 years to figure this out. And why do we do this? We wanted as many kids in our locker room to feel that they were starters, that they had the responsibility, if that package was on the game, for a critical third down call, uh, for a critical clock situation call, that the whole outcome of the game may depend on them doing their job. And every other player knew it. So you talk about creating peer pressure. And it was, uh, it was great, and we still try to do it. So these guys all were starters. It kept more players engaged in meetings, walkthroughs in practice. So then late year when we had injuries, we had other guys that had played football that had been preparing like a starter for eight to 10 weeks. And, and, and this was another uh, unintended consequence of it. If you have a younger, talented player that can't handle the volume of everything you're doing, just ask him to be your nickel mic. And he learns to do that. And then maybe by game four, he can be your nickel mic and your quarter drop. And then by game eight, he can do three different roles. And we say healthier, mentally healthier, physically healthier when we did this. And it really was, uh, was, was really good stuff. And we still try to do it. And it just, it helps them around your football team. And again, Fourth down, you're gonna have your best guys. But our best guys were more rested because we did this earlier in the game. And uh, I stole this from a rival. Um, you know, that he had a, he took a job and there was a guy in his staff I interviewed and I said, what is the best thing you do? He said, our head coach makes us do this. And our defensive coach just, because he knew, I, my eyes lit up. <laughs> but I think he would tell you it's, it's one of the best things we do as a program now. And so now between our offense and our defense and our special teams guys, we got over half of our locker room that know they're gonna play in games. So, okay, we do the same thing on offense. Offensively, it's a little different, but we try to have a lot of different personnel groupings. Uh, we give animal names to our personnel groupings. There's times we're getting on the internet to find some random animal in Southeast Europe so we can name another personnel group. You know, but, you know, we have tiger, zebra, jaguar, jumbo, elephant, hawk, falcon, every bird. And it's the same thing. It might be one play a game. Hey, if we cross midfield, uh, we're going to go with hawk personnel and run this play, and you're the starter. And so it, it gets more offensive players involved. And why do we do that? On offense, I think it creates more internal competition. 
that if you're zebra and tiger and your second tight end is playing better than your third receiver, now our offense will start morphing into that personnel group. So the kids know that when their personnel group's on the, the field, they're making plays and they're doing things right, their snap count can go up. And conversely, if they don't, it's going to go down. Uh, we're not married to one grouping. Um, if we get two injuries at tight end, we're capable of being a four receiver team. Um, you know, in college, we're not going to sign a free agent to replace them. We have who we have. And, and I think it allows our offense to evolve. There are years that we've started as an 11 team, and at the end of the year, we were a 12 team. There's years we started as a 21 team, and we ended up as a 10 team. Because of injuries, younger kids stepping up, but it gives guys meaningful reps every week in practice. And it gives us a lot of flexibility with what we do. Okay? Um, when my first really offensive job was with a guy named Hank Small at Lehigh, was one of the first guys that was on the cutting edge of the West Coast pass game in the Northeast. And Hank was a brilliant mind. And I got this lesson from New York State. What was his name, Greg? Oh, sorry. Yeah. I was telling you, I was recruiting, uh, I was recruiting downstate at Saugerties High School, and it was like in the early 90s. And, and I thought I was this brilliant whiz kid with this passing game. And I met this coach late, we were clinicking, and I was given all our protections and slides and empty stuff. And about halfway through it, he just dropped his head and went like this. And he said, son, get this straight. If you're going to win football games in New York and the Northeast, you better be able to run the football. And, and he was right. He said, at some point, if you coach in the Northeast in New York State, you're going to be playing for a championship in November, and it's going to be snowy, raining, freezing cold, and all that stuff, Sonny, ain't going to work. And, uh, and he was dead right. And uh, I thought about it because at the time I was at Lehigh, and then I coached at Fordham, and all my, you know, and it, you know, we threw the ball, but if one day the, the wind was sideways and it was 12 degrees, we couldn't run the football. And, and one year in 1993, we almost lost the championship when we were at Lehigh against Bucknell because it was wet, rainy, cold. <coughs> We couldn't run the football. We were a better team than them, but they beat us because they could run it and we couldn't. And so after that, I always made uh, running the football and, and stopping the run one of our core beliefs. And you know, it's not just uh, word speaking. Every program that I've been a head coach, we started out really, really bad as a program and really, really bad running the football. So as, as Brian said, I was the youngest head coach in the country. 1999 at Fordham, I was 31 years old, I had all the answers, all the solutions, and I did such a great job, we didn't win one game. Um, I somehow took a bad program and made it worse. But boy, I had great pass ideas. Um, so we averaged almost 84 yards a game, we scored 15 points a game, and we did win a, a football game. And that year, offensively and defense, I said, if anything, we're going to learn how to run the football. So four years later, our run game got a lot better. We scored more points and we won football games. And I thought the run correlation had something to do with it. And then when we went down to Richmond, I thought for a year, because we were in the South, I could throw that away. And then I looked at the schedule and saw that we played Maine, New Hampshire, Northeastern in November. So our first year there, again, we, we didn't run the football very well. And we were three and eight. 2007, we were 11-3, won the championship, and ran the ball for 234 yards a game, and we scored 35 points a game. And then when I interviewed at uh, Bowling Green, at that point, everybody in the MAC was running spread offenses. And so when I interviewed for the job, I said, we're, we're not going to be a complete spread. We're going to be physical. We're going to run the ball. This is what I believe in. And he's like, why? I said, because at some point in November, we might have to play in Buffalo to win a championship. And if it's snowing, I want to be able to, to, to run the ball and win the football game. And in 2013 at Bowling Green, we went to Buffalo uh, November 28th to play them for the championship. And the day before, there was three feet of snow on the ground. And that next day, we, we ran the football and we won the game and won the championship. So it was the exact interview. We're going to go, have to go to Buffalo, maybe bad weather. And I lived in Buffalo for 18 years, so 
you're from Buffalo, don't be insulted. That's my home. But it snows in Buffalo. And it snowed that day. And we couldn't throw it very well. But we ran it. And that allowed us to win the game. And that was part of our transformation at Bowling Green. In 2010, we ran the ball for 62 yards a game. We were dead last in the country at running the football. 2013, we win 10 games, and we're running the football for almost 200 yards a game. So everything that we do is we try to make sure we're getting better at running the football. And at times, we'll run the football against bad looks. We can't block the extra hat. If you try to draw all that stuff up perfect, it's, it, to me, it's a mentality and a physicalness and a mindset. And how do we get better at it? Every day in practice, we commit time to it. There is not a practice at Wake Forest that we won't take 15 to 25 minutes of our practice devoted to running the football. It'll be inside run. We will have periods that we have team run periods, and I'll tell the offensive coordinator in 10 plays, there can't be more than two times that we throw the football, whether it's play action or a bubble screen. And they'll try to convince me that the bubble screen is part of the run game. <laughs> and I'll say, in this period, it's not. We're going to run the football. We're going to run it against base. We're going to run it against nickel. We're going to run it against blitz. And, we're, and, it, and, it, and it takes time. I don't think there's anything harder in football than learning how to run the football. Because it takes time. And you can't be good at it in one year. But if you're coaching football in this state, I think it's hard to be consistently good unless you can do this. And to the spread guys, I feel differently. I apologize. This is just a core belief I have. That I will not hire an offensive coordinator that isn't committed to running the football. Um, and we spend time at it. And at times, the offense is a disadvantage because I'll let the team put the safety in the box. And we can't block the hat. And I'm going to say that's four-minute offense. And there's times I'll say, defense, you've got to remove that linebacker. And make it a light box and teach the kids to, you know, it can't always be calls that get you off the field. It's got to be shed the block, get the linebacker off the back. You know, we give these guys excuses that the extra half will make the ball, and it gives them an excuse to not make plays. Sometimes a football player has got to get off the block and make a play when the numbers aren't good. Sometimes the back's got to make a guy miss. And so we spend time doing this every single day in practice. And, uh, you know, we go back, and there's times we're in bad defenses, and we run bad plays, but I don't care. We're going to learn how to be physical and run the football. Okay? Um, how much time do I have? Um, Ten more minutes? Yeah. Okay. Um, here, here's another core belief that we have, that the most important statistic in football in terms of win or losing the game is turnover margin. So this poster... We have about 20 of these in our, in our office. Uh, the running back room, the quarterback room, the tight end room, the special teams room. But we say the ball is in the program. Everything about football is about possession of the ball. Okay, so if you're on defense, you're trying to get the ball back. If you're on special teams, you're trying to advance the ball. On offense, you're trying to keep the ball. So everything in football is about Having the ball and keeping it, or if you don't have any, getting it back. And so we tell our players, the ball is the program. We trust you with the football. We are trusting you with the 150 people, coaches, staff, players in our room. We are trusting you uh, with the wives and the children of our football coaches. If you have the ball, the entire program is in your hands. Okay, And, and you need to guard it accordingly. So we say the ball is the program. If we're trusting you with the football, we're trusting the whole program with you. And we don't have a, a lot of different, you know, five points of pressure and do this and do that, whatever. We have a very simple term. We call it chin. Anytime a player in our team has the football, okay, we want his eagle claw grip and the tip of the football to be at his chin. And that will cover the bicep, the forearm, the palm, the fingers, the chest plate. We never, ever, ever want that ball hanging loose like this. And the NFL freaking kills us with this, because every time those guys get it, you know, and they're making $8 million, and the kid feels that's OK. It's not OK in our program. So in practice, we, every time a kid has a ball, you'll hear 15 of us yelling, chin, chin, chin. 
and we keep track on offense, at the end of practice, we have a thing that we call LOCs for offensive skill players. Lack of chins. And if that tip is ever not facing the chin, it's a mark, and they've got an up-down score at the next practice. Okay, so we say this. They always need to chin the ball. They can never, ever switch the ball in traffic. The ball always has to be tucked away from the outside arm or away from the nearest threat. And we never, ever want to play to end that we're not handing the ball to the official. We never want a late fumble that the official is going to decide did it come out early, did it come out late. And we teach that in practice. So after every play in practice, okay, we will film whether he's chinning the football, is the ball on the outside arm, did they switch it, and at the end of the play, did they give it back to the manager or the official? And if they don't do any one of those four things, it's an LOC. So what we're doing is we're trying to create a culture uh, in our program that we take care of the football. You know, and I'll make jokes that they, they just dropped you know, their, uh, their, their pet or their girlfriend or, or whatever. But everything we represent is we take care of that football. Okay? And I've done this study now for three or four years. And, uh, and I say this to our offense. Our offense sits here, our defense sits here. And I say to the offense, if I could give you one thing to do that would guarantee you that we'll be in a bowl game in the field. And they go, yes. If you just take care of the football, we'll win the game. If you break this down, top 10 offenses, top 10 third down conversions, top 10 whatever, there's nothing that correlates more offensively with winning football games than not turning the football over. And I'll show them top 10 offenses, and there's teams that win and lose. Top 10 third down offenses, there's teams that win or lose. Top 10 best teams at not turning the football over, almost all of them win with like two exceptions over the last three years. So I'll tell the offense, and I'll break down where we were the year before, I broke down where we were at Bowling Green, uh, but and I'm sorry, I'll start on defense. I'll tell the defense the same thing. If you just turn the ball over, I guarantee you will win. So in 2013, um, in the ACC, the three best teams at generating turnovers were Florida State, Clemson, Miami. And by no accident, they won 14, 11, and nine games. Nationally, the top five teams all were in bowl games and won. I mean, Tulane traditionally has not been a real strong program, but 2013, they took care of the football and they went to a bowl. Their offensive numbers weren't high, their defensive numbers weren't high. They were good at, not turn, at, at turning it over, and they won. So we just tell our defense, if you just get the thing turned over, we're gonna win games. And then the, per, the importance of protecting the football. The year we won the championship at Bowling Green, we had 11 turnovers the whole year. That had a lot to do with us winning the championship. In the ACC that year, the three teams that turned the ball over the least all went to bowls. Nationally, the, th the three best teams all won nine double-digit games. So this held up on both sides of the football. The offense doesn't turn it over, you're going to win. If the defense creates turnovers, you're going to win. And then you get turnover margin, and then it gets blown out of the water. If you're good at doing both, <coughs> we broke it in 2013. Every ACC team that had a positive turnover margin went to a bowl. Every team that had a negative turnover margin was home in December and January. Okay, and if you broke it down nationally, those were the top five teams, uh, top four or five teams nationally, and then the bottom three nationally were two and 10, one and 11, one and 11. Okay, so that's great. Every coach talks about taking care of the football and hold on to it, but how do you emphasize it? Okay, the way that we emphasize it is we take three to five minutes in every single practice all year long. If you come down to spring football, <coughs> fall camp, Tuesday, Wednesday, <coughs> Thursday practice at Wake Forest, we have a period every single day that we call ball security, ball disruption. That all the offense does is we do drills 
that they are securing the football. So it might be sideline tackle that are chinning and defending. We have a job that we catch the ball and we split defenders and we put two hands over it. We have a drill that we have our players go around bags and the ball's in the outside arm and another guy is trying to strip it. So we have a series of about 12 different drills and we rotate them every week that our players will have 12 different drills that have to try to ball security. Now, are the drills the reason that we become good at it? No. I believe it's, it's so important we never, ever go a day without doing it. And it's three days. But if it's that important, we've got to devote time to it. So on offense, we do all these drills. On defense, and I think Coach Bullock from Syracuse is talking on this later. Is that the same circuit we did, Clark? That our defense will have a series of drills that all they work on is disrupting the football. Second tackler in, stripping it. Um, we are big at near hand disruption. If I'm a, uh, a left defensive end and it's a right hand quarterback, we work like crazy trying to mirror the quarterback's hand. Every time we knock a ball down, that's a ball disruption. That eliminates a play. And we have a whole series of drills that we do. And uh, I was going to show film on it, but I'm assuming Coach Bull is going to do that with Syracuse. So I, uh, I won't take away his thunder, and I'm running out of time. So again, um, thank you very much. This is an honor to, to speak to this group. And uh, again, uh, this group has done so much to pr promote football in New York. We used to not run the first time that we had a coach's 20 years now. This is our 15th year, I believe. Yeah, so 20 years ago, every other state had these. We didn't. Now this thing is huge. And we've got the governor bulls and state playoffs. And I will say this, the, the respect nationally for New York State football has gone up so much in the last 20 years. And it's because of the coaches in this room. And uh, again, I, I'm a product of you guys. So thank you very much. Visit us at Wake Forest. And uh, good luck this year. Thank you.